When I used to run photographic holidays, it wasn't a good idea to swank around with a posh camera costing thousands of pounds. All too often, it was the camera that got the praise and not the photographer. So the burning question is, can I achieve the same results with a camera costing hundreds of pounds instead of thousands? Time to downsize. So instead, I'm going to take to offer you a series of photographs taken with the Olympus EM10. This is the Mark II version. I think we're currently up to Mark IV. It'll cost you about five or six hundred pounds and it comes with the pancake lens which is only, oh, it's only a three times optical zoom. So let's see what I can do with this combination. I'm not a technocrat, by the way. I don't listen to what the soothsayers uh, tell us how to take uh, photographs. In fact, in medieval times, if they got it wrong, they were burnt at the stake, a law that wasn't repealed until 1959. Mind you, you might like to do that to me, but please judge my pictures as presented. We might start together and we might finish together, but to hell what goes on in the middle. As a photographer who progressed over many years from film to digital, then my methods are what might be described as uh, traditional. Now the undeniable sophistication of computerized cameras, well really they are not an answer they are just an aid. Therefore, I will explain my technique using good old shutter speeds and apertures. Furthermore, I will explain my technique from the level of a beginner, perhaps the most likely person who would purchase this entry level camera into the OMD Olympus system. Commencing with a simple trip to my local common for autumn colours, I first set the controls to aperture priority. I appreciate that the novice might feel safer on program or auto, but you are not in charge, even if the results are to your liking. If we are to take notice of what the experts say, most cameras, or should I say, lenses perform at their best at f8 or 11. So by switching to aperture priority this can be set, the camera automatically choosing the appropriate shutter speed. Aperture priority is essential for close-ups. The closer you get to the subject, depth of field, that is sharpness from front to back, is reduced. Remember, a small aperture increases depth of field, but a large aperture reduces it, and if you are not careful, you can end up with only part of the shrub sharp. Furthermore, it is important that the background is unsharp, so that the shrub stands out from the background. Therefore, some kind of control is necessary. This traditional technique is more difficult to achieve with a smartphone. Everything, yes, everything will be sharp with the shrub merging into the background because their sensors are so tiny they require shorter focal length lenses and they will increase depth of field beyond whatever aperture is in use. With the nettle, the background is unsharp, but the nettle itself is sharp. Factor 8 was sufficient to throw the background out of focus. And I have zoomed towards telephoto a little bit, which reduces depth of field a little bit more. But I seem to have judged it about right. I am often asked what the difference is between a snap and a photograph. And I have just demonstrated two examples, using F8 to obtain a good quality image 
and using aperture priority control to render the subject sharp and not the background. All of this can be done with the EM10. A photograph succeeds or fails by the quality of light and how it is handled. A beginner might not appreciate that no camera, even the most expensive, is as good as the human eye. The saying that we all see colour differently might be more accurate than we are prepared to give credit. Understanding these variances is one of the secrets of photography, and the difference that is likely to plague the aspiring, even the experienced photographer, the most is contrast, better known in photo circles as high dynamic range, whereby the hoped-for excellence of an image is spoiled by under- or overexposed parts of the image. Sophisticated software can correct this, but the way an image is recorded first is just as important. We all love to take a dawn or sunset, but how often are you happy with the results? Often the colours lack intensity, even look washed out. This is because the landscape surrounding the sunrise or sunset is still in shade, and if the camera metering is on matrix or ESP, it will read too much of the dark area. Because of reflected light, this is easier to resolve over water, otherwise you need to spot meter, save to raw, and then correct shadows in post-production. That was certainly the technique for these shots in Caterham Cemetery, and I cannot help feeling that my careful control of exposure adds its own spiritual emotion to these headstones, receiving the first rays of dawn. Night shots are a challenge for photographers, so does the EM10 Mark II rise to this challenge? Now first, to test things out, I trotted into town and took some experimental shots hand-held. I am encouraged. The shutter speeds are an eighth and a third of a second, respectively. With the camera on program, spot metering a highlight with white balance on auto. Off for bigger prey tomorrow. Living close to London with good rail links, a setting near the Thames was going to offer the photographic challenge, so I started my adventure from Blackfriars Station. A new skyscraper in Bishopsgate now dominates the city skyline. It has 62 floors and stands at 912 feet tall just short of the shard across the river by London Bridge Station. After leaving Blackfriars, it soon became an eye-catching focal point at the end of Queen Victoria Street, photographically helped by the absence of traffic and people due to lockdown. Now, when pointing the camera up, an optical distortion known as converging verticals occurs, and, for the observant, something a bit more erotic in Lombard Street. Now the plan was to walk around the Thames from late afternoon until nightfall, crossing the river by Tower Bridge and London Bridge. Following a quick peep in All Hallows by the Tower, which surprisingly was open, I started my trip from the Tower, the setting sun now illuminating only parts of the castle, which I spot metered to maintain colour intensity, as much of the structure was now in shadow. As day slowly progressed towards night, the challenge I had set myself with the EM-10 soon became greater. I kept the ISO at 200, which, on the face of it, only adds to my problems, but I wanted a reference point. However, as darkness falls, the metering is fooled by the increased dominance of 
black, which it reads as grey, triggering overexposure even when spot metering. The answer? Well, that is to reduce the EV value, often as much as minus 2, and then checking the image with an electronic finder, which will give a reasonable idea of how it will look. I spot metered a highlight that gave the projected colours that I could foresee, exposing to the left, not right, locking it by half depressing the shutter button before recomposing and correcting any underexposure in Lightroom. As Micro Four Thirds gives more depth of field than other formats, the difference that might occur between metering and focusing points becomes unimportant anyway. Judge for yourself by the images and not by how they are taken. The image stabilization worked well, but there is some noise, which, after all, is preferable to blown out highlights caused by exposing to the right that can't be corrected. However, I think that my professional EM1 would have done a better job. By now, I was close to London Bridge Station, completely rebuilt and extended by opening up a lower level that confuses many passengers who remember the old layout. But it is certainly impressive with all those escalators. No chance for me getting lost as my usual train goes from Platform 4.